This is China and the World, hosted by Asia Society Switzerland. Hello and welcome to the third episode of China and the World, where we are looking at the evolving role of China in different regions and countries. I'm your host, Nico Lossinger. Before we start, if you enjoy listening to this podcast and would like to support us, the best way to do that is to become a member of Asia Society Switzerland. If you already are a member, thank you. If you'd like to join and get access to exclusive member events and content, please visit our website asiasociety.org slash Switzerland to learn more. Today, we will talk about China's fast-changing and multifaceted relationship with an entire continent, Africa. How has China's relationship with African countries evolved over the last decades? What is the role that technology plays in that relationship? And how can we expect the relationship to develop as China is engaging more and more with countries around the world? No other country has responded to the call for investments in Africa like China. Since the 1990s, China's economic and financial engagement on the African continent has been growing steadily. In the West, this has sometimes raised suspicions. China is often accused to pursue neo-colonial policies, and it's questioned if China's approach to the continent really can offer a viable alternative to Western aid and charity. One person who has followed all this very closely is Eric Ollander, the co-founder of the China Africa Project, an independent, non-partisan media initiative dedicated to exploring every facet of China's engagement in Africa. Eric started the project because he wanted to provide a more balanced view on China-Africa relations. It came about when I was living in Kinshasa in the Congo, and I was seeing the U.S. and European media coverage of China in Africa, and it was very extreme and polarizing. And when I spoke with my Congolese colleagues and asked them, they gave me these complex, nuanced, textured answers. And I said, that's my story. As part of his project, Eric Ollander is the co-host of the weekly China in Africa podcast. He is a fluent Mandarin speaker, journalist, and a longtime China watcher. To set the scene, let's hear more about China's role in Africa from Eric in conversation with Alexandra Gazzala. Alexandra is the head of research at the Singularity Group and a senior non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. This was recorded at an Asia Society Switzerland event in mid-2020. When we hear China-Africa relations, there is a tendency sometimes to think about, oh gosh, this is really new, this is novel, these relations, this is happening for the first time. But this isn't new. China has had relations uh, of various kinds with various African states dating back as far as the Ming Dynasty. At the time, it was trading with Kenya and Somalia. And maybe more in recent history, we can look at that period from the 1950s to the 1970s, when Beijing was very actively courting then the newly independent African states economically as well, and, and also politically with, I think, some mixed successes. But I would love your thoughts maybe to kick things off about how should we be thinking about what we're looking at today in that broader context of China's relations with the continent over the years? Yeah, that's a great place to start because China's relationship in Africa has gone through waves and we're about to embark on a new wave right now, but it's gone through these phases. We won't go back all the way to the 15th century in Zhenghe, but what we will do is let's kind of fast forward to the 1950s to 1970s, which was an ideological wave. That was clearly when Mao was trying to export communism and revolution. Uh, that was the building of the Tazara Railway, which is really one of the big first infrastructure projects that China built in Africa. Again, that was very ideologically driven. It then went as China kind of turned inwards during the Cultural Revolution and kind of the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution. They kind of went, you know, quiet in Africa for quite some time until let's kind of bring us up to the Hu Jintao period and the China going out. And that's where we start to see the first stages of what we're experiencing today, which was this idea that China wanted to go out into the world to find, you know, new opportunities for its state-owned enterprises, new markets for its goods. It was starting to build up some excess capacity. And it wanted to kind of, you know, feel its way across the river, as they say. And Africa presented a very, very low barrier to entry market. Unlike, say, Central Asia, which was still very complicated by Russia's influence, Europe is very expensive, the U.S. is complicated for a lot of reasons. Here in Asia, the historical complexities make it difficult for China to go out. Africa was sitting there as basically you could do it. And this was a time also 
that the United States and Europe have taken their eye off of Africa. So there was, again, very little resistance to them coming in. And at that time, they needed the oil, mineral, and timber that Africa was selling, and they really weren't buying from other places. So that's the first stage of our modern era in the China-Africa relationship. Yeah, and maybe that's a great place because I'd love to spend a little bit of time on that, the oil and the resources, breaking down some of the investments in that space, because I think we're also seeing a diversification of Chinese investments and of the investment landscape. But the first thing that comes to mind when most most people think about China-Africa and Chinese investments in Africa is very much that resource-heavy oil extraction side of the equation. Can you maybe give us a little bit of color on some of the dynamics there? And of course, they they vary from country to, to country as well. Yeah, it does vary a lot. But so again, the relationship for most people is one they think of of resource and trade, resource extraction and trade. And that was, in fact, the early stages of all of this. So 70% of the trade that's done between China, Africa, is concentrated into three categories of products, oil, mineral, and timber. Most of that comes from 10 African countries. So it's a highly unequal relationship. China is not trading equally with the continent. China is not investing equally in the continent. One other very, very important distinction to make that a lot of people make this mistake, they confuse the words trade and investment. So China is Africa's largest trading partner. It is the largest partner of about 30 some odd countries. Africa does trade more with the European Union than China, but China's the largest country partner. So very important. But when it comes to FDI, China's actually down the list a little bit. So the United States remains the number one source of of FDI. Uh, Depending on how you count it, the UAE, even Malaysia and France are also much higher. China's been moving up. But in investment, China's been very, very light. Because remember, all of these infrastructure projects that China's building, they're not investing. Those are funded by loans and concessional grants and lots of complex tools, but it's not an investment. So I think that's just a very important kind of scene setting distinction to make because a lot of people kind of confuse those two. Absolutely. And in the context of those loans, there's been a good deal of attention, especially recently now in the context of of COVID, maybe we can fast forward a little bit about some of the terms and some of the conditions of those loans. We hear about debt traps, China's debt trap diplomacy, that these large infrastructure projects are basically burdening African economies um, even more so than, than they otherwise would be. What are some of your thoughts on that? What are some of your reflections on, on some of the narratives around these loans? So there's a lot of discussions. The United States has been pushing the debt trap narrative quite aggressively, not just in Africa, but around the world. Uh, we have to kind of put it right out there. Uh, scholars like Deborah Braudigam and many others have been looking at this issue upside down, left and right, you name it. There is no evidence of the debt trap narrative as it's been laid out by the American government. I think that's just a really important, that is, and the debt trap, just for those of you not familiar with it, is this idea that China loads up countries with unsustainable amounts of debt. It knows that these countries can't repay them. So what it does in lieu of payment is it seizes an asset. Now, if you talk to the Chinese, they go, this is not the way we work. And I've talked to people at the Exim Bank. I've talked to people in think tanks. They go, why would we want to own these assets when, you know, who gets paid back in bankruptcy first? It's not the owner. It's the investor. And it's just, again, it's just a big misreading of the way that people approach the Chinese, you know, strategy on loans and debt. Let's go go back to the African side of this. Too often in this discussion, it's framed as China doing something to Africa. And Africans are stripped of agency. Africans are stripped of their identity. And again, Africans are made to be the victims in all of this. What is China doing to Africa? And that is really a a very harmful way of looking at this relationship because Africa absolutely has agency in all of this. And one of the things that they told the Chinese up front when this all started back in the mid 2000s was we are tired of charity and aid. We've had a half century of this from the U.S. and Europe, and it hasn't worked. We want to try something different. We don't want you to give us the money. This was a very clear instruction that came from African stakeholders. And so the Chinese said, great, because we don't like to do aid either. So we're going to do these very, very low interest, long-term concessional loans. Sometimes they're priced well, sometimes they're not. But at the end of the day, it's never intended to be aid. And that, to me, is a maturation of Africa's engagement with the outside world. 
and what comes with a loan, whether it's you get a car loan or I get a house loan, there's collateral with it. That is the nature of a loan. And one of the most interesting things about the discussion that we've seen is that when people see the contracts and they see collateral in it, they go, shock, horror, amazing. How can you have collateral for a loan? Or they'll say, people, you know, the Chinese will want something in exchange for the debt. Well, yes, because that's what lenders do. That is the natural relationship. Now, the interesting thing, and again, we go back to Deborah Braudigam and the China-Africa Research Initiative, and there's a lot of scholars who look at this. There is not any evidence right now, and Venezuela is really the best example of this, of the Chinese crushing these countries with debt and then exacting kind of painful extractions out of them. We haven't seen that. That said, a lot of the deals as they've been structured uh, are oftentimes not in the favor of Africans. That's just the nature of the fact that China oftentimes when it negotiates with a Ghana, with Botswana, with these smaller countries, is able to extract terms that are far better and in its favor. But that has less to do actually with China and more to do with the power dynamic that exists between a wealthy country and a non-wealthy country. So that also is a very similar dynamic what we see in France's relationship and the U.S. relationship in Africa as well. Already we see how complicated and multi-layered the relationship between China and Africa is. I find it really notable that Western criticism so often reverts to this widely debunked theory of debt traps. Because that, of course, draws on our own stereotypes of African countries as receivers of aid with basically little agency. As Eric tells it, over the years, China has been very good at building relationships with Africa's governing class. Not just with leaders, but also state-owned media and enterprises. Many of these contacts also happen at the provincial levels. In contrast, Eric says, China has struggled to really engage African civil society. Notably, in April 2020, there was what's become known as the Guangzhou Incident, when dozens, possibly hundreds of African residents in the southern Chinese city of Guangzhou were evicted from their homes and hotels. And there were lots of videos on social media showing their maltreatment, and that led to protests in different African countries. The Chinese authorities cited COVID-19 regulations and denied allegations of racism, but the episode did hurt China's image across Africa. Especially for younger Africans, the image of China has often been shaped by another crucial factor of the China-Africa relationship, and that is technology. It's ironic that all of this that we're talking about in terms of the, the kind of uprising of African civil society and youth is happening on the back of Chinese-built networks and using Chinese phones. So there is a certain irony there that the African tech kind of environment today is absolutely inseparable from China's investment in it. So 70% of the 4G network has been built by Huawei. Huawei is absolutely instrumental in, in, in the African digital story. ZTE is also there, but let's start with the infrastructure and the network infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What you cannot underestimate is the power of this. And, and again, and, and this is the soft power. So when we talk about Chinese soft power, oftentimes people think of soft power in the form of like Hollywood movies, Beyonce and things like that. In many parts of Africa that I've traveled in, when I talk to people about China, what, the, what people will do, particularly young people, is they'll take out their phone and they'll say, I love China. And I love Huawei. I love Techno. I love Boomplay. I love all of these Chinese tech brands that they've bought. Because why? Because they're teenagers. And oftentimes, teenagers see the world through tech and they value that. But also, people know the fact that without Huawei, there is no alternative. And this is the big failing of the U.S. approach and the U.S. criticism on Huawei. The United States will go to a Safaricom or it will go to a government in Africa and say, you shouldn't use Huawei because it's dangerous. Okay. And Safaricom will say, well, great. What do you want me to do? I've got $50 million worth of Huawei gear. Do you want me to rip that out? Are you going to provide me an equivalent from Ericsson or Samsung and then the financing and then the installation and the whole package? What the Chinese have been able to do is come up with a development model that's a turnkey model. And what they do is they will come in with Huawei equipment, Huawei financing, Huawei engineers, and they will get that thing going. And that's been absolutely critical. But now what we're seeing in the tech space is gone beyond just Huawei. That is the very simplistic basic. That was a five-year-old story. The story today is Boomplay, 62 million customers. They're crushing Spotify, crushing Apple Music. Nowhere else in the world does that happen. Uh, that's a streaming music service. We're looking at Opay, Pompay. These are the new kind of uh, mobile service, mobile money, uh, mobile, uh, you know, ride hailing in Nigeria. Venture capital is now starting to come in and venture capital money is investing in 
uh, lorry systems, which is a Uber for trucks in Kenya. And then we've got Transin. And Transin is really the most important story in tech right now uh, that very few people understand. It's a Shenzhen-based company. It just went public on the Shanghai Star Exchange last year, got a valuation of $7 billion, mostly from selling phones in Africa. Uh, 52.5, 53% of the entire African mobile phone market is Transin. It is remarkable. They are the dominant player in both smartphones and feature phones. And Transin also has a walled garden, just like Apple does, that if you want to get an app on the Transin OS, you have to then accommodate to the way that they do things. Transin is also building out all these other services like Boomplay. They are a funder with Boomplay. They're doing finance. They're doing all these different things. And so Transin is a big player. Then the other part of it is let's talk about start times. 37 countries, 33 million uh, pay TV subscribers. Uh, they're now producing original content. But Start Times arguably is the most important media company now in Africa. So 33 million homes, four or five people minimum per home. We're looking at a brand that touches 100 million people a day. That is a very, very important uh, you know, player as well. And then there's all the other social media. So TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, is now coming in. There's another short media service called uh, Viscuit that's there, 10 million users. Opera is the number two mobile browser in the market. That's owned by a Chinese company. Uh, so the tech space is really inseparable from China. Actually, a question on the back of that. In the context of these larger scale investments that I think tend to come to mind when we think about Chinese investments, the roads, the bridges, so on and so forth, there's often been the sentiment, um, I think rightly so, from European and American companies that, gosh, we don't have the means to compete on that level. We can't compete with China when it comes to those kinds of projects. With this widening now that we're talking about a little bit of the investment landscape, as you say, to tech, there's more VC funds coming in. Is this, in your view, posing now even more of a challenge for European and American companies? Or is this now kind of, in a way, leveling the playing field, so to speak, so an opening perhaps opportunities for European companies, European VC funds to also come into African markets and be competitive vis-a-vis -vis China? Yes and no. The Chinese oftentimes get a lot of the headlines and a lot of the attention because they are the new kid on the block. At the end of the day, Visa International, the credit card company, invested far more alone than, than the Chinese did last year. Uh, so American VC and American investment is still very, very active in Africa. And that's, again, go back to the fact that Americans are still the number one source of investment for Africa. We always seem to forget that America's role is actually still instrumental in Africa, even though they don't get the press and the attention for it. Uh, that being said, the Chinese are able to compete in spaces where the Americans simply can't. That is the merger of hardware and software. That's where a company like Techno and StarTimes have done so well, is they're able to build low-cost products using the very, very cheap manufacturing operations that they have in places like Guangdong province, and being able to kind of custom build products specifically for the African market. Techno's success is built entirely on the fact that they build phones and services specifically for Africans. Apple does not do that. Uh, Samsung is starting to do it to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, these companies are looking for higher yields and higher profit margins than what the Chinese are accustomed to. You know, Chinese can be very happy with three to 5% for a very long time. Apple won't get out of bed for that. And so that is one of the big problems that, that these companies have is that the profit margins are oftentimes in the single digits. But yet the Chinese had found a very, very effective model at making a lot of money off of single digits and gobbling up market share early on. And again, the Chinese sense of time in Africa is also very, very different. It always shocks me when I talk to Chinese investors in Africa, and they're looking at 50-year horizons. Who thinks in, 50, in terms of half centuries? I mean, that is remarkable. 25, 50 years they're looking at. So the bumps in the road that we see now, for them, they're pretty chill about it quite a bit. We think in terms of quarters and years. And so we look at these difficulties now and think, penny, penny, the sky is falling. We're going to pull out or we're going to do something. Uh, they don't see it that way, a lot of this, particularly some of the state-owned enterprises. So, but yet, that being said, we saw the first quarter data, Global Data, which is a, a London analytics firm, just released first quarter M&A data from China. Lots of outbound M&A coming, none of it going to Africa. Europe, North America, the Mideast. So again, Africa may 
be fading in terms of its popularity with China simply because the risk profile uh, may be too high and the returns now you can get because everything is on sale right now. Everything's on sale in Europe, in the US, in the Middle East. And so we're seeing cash rich Chinese companies going out and maybe going to do a lot of acquisitions, but Africa is not necessarily the place they're going to go. You alluded, Eric, to China perhaps pulling back a little bit from Africa economically, Africa perhaps playing not as significant of a role in Beijing's calculus when it comes to the econ side of things. So then with that said, what role do you see Africa playing more of, if any role, um, if, yeah. if, as you say, this dynamic is shifting? So this is actually something that we started to see going back to 2015, 2016. So remember early on in the early mid 2000s, when China was first going out, it didn't have a lot of opportunities and a lot of options on where it could source raw materials, markets, and do things like that. A, a lot has changed from the mid 2000s to now. The Belt and Road now is a real thing, whatever the Belt and Road is. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's a thing. Uh, it's out there. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent. Markets have been opened. And so we started to see now this diversification away from Africa. So the, uh, you know, the buying of oil, for example, that was so prominent in Angola with the Angola model and in South Sudan and in Sudan and the Sudanese as well. Uh, now, uh, Chinese oil buying out of Saudi Arabia went up last year by 47%. They don't need to go to Africa for the oil, mineral, and timber. Uh, China does a third more trade, $300 billion with South America than it does with Africa. It has expanded its trade with Europe. It's expanding into Central Europe, Central Asia. So what does China actually want from Africa? I'm going to make the argument, and this has been drawn heavily from a number of different professors like Professor Joshua Eisenman from the University of Notre Dame, who kind of talks about the evolution of the political military relationship. So what does the value of Africa bring to China today? What we saw just last week or the week before with the WHO and the United States pulling out and every single African leader for the most part, standing up in defense of Tedros and the WHO, that's something that brings warmth and warm fuzzies to the Chinese who like that. When every African government for the most part tells the United States to buzz off on Huawei, when 17 African governments sign a letter supporting China's position on Xinjiang, when Uganda comes out proactively to support the Chinese position on Hong Kong, on the South China Sea, these core national interests for the Chinese are so important. I define them by, this is my acronym, 4THKXJ. Let's go through it. Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, the party, Hong Kong, Xinjiang. That's what's important to China. And when they see this coalition of 54 African votes that do kind of oftentimes work together as we saw at the Food and Agriculture Organization last year, where the entire African bloc voted for the Chinese candidate on the first round. The Cameroonian candidate withdrew so that the Chinese could actually have of their candidate up against the Americans. That's the value, I think, that we're going to see more on with the Chinese in Africa. So this is why maybe the civil society tensions that we're seeing right now, maybe in the long run, they don't actually matter that much. You know, if people don't like the Chinese, I don't think Xi Jinping's going to lose any sleep over that. And now on the military side, China is the largest contributor of peacekeeping troops of any permanent member of the Security Council in Africa. China is expanding its influence in terms of military to military relationship. It's got the Djibouti base. It probably will not build other bases, but it will probably then sell more weapons. Uh, and that's something, a big trend that we've seen is China's increase of, of both large and small arms sales have gone up quite a bit in Africa. But that might be where this direction of this relationship is going, less to the all-encompassing, we want to be liked by everybody. And maybe they're just going to recognize the fact that people aren't going to like them. But if they get people to buy Huawei, they're happy. As so often, it feels that while the world is just really catching up to a China-related topic, the reality has already started moving elsewhere. In the case of China and Africa, a shift from a purely economic relationship to a broader cooperation that extends to global governance and security issues. It's a space worth watching in the future as well, says Eric. I mean, Africa is super important for China. And if you're following China globally, you're going to want to keep an eye on what's happening in Africa. They do things first in Africa before they do things elsewhere. The first military base, the first stake in a media company, the first Twitter accounts were, were in Africa. You see this as a test bed for their policies. You see this as a test bed for them trying new, new experiments in tech and in investing in lots of different things. And once they kind of do things in Africa in an exciting way, again, this is all 
not necessarily bad stuff. They then roll them out. So I encourage you to keep an eye on the China-Africa relationship in part if you want to see what they're going to do in other parts of the world. This is a relationship that is absolutely in flux right now. It's changing. And yes, it really is changing fast, also under the impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic. And that's it for today. If you want to hear more from Eric Olander and Alexandra Gazzala, please check out Eric's China in Africa podcast and Alexandra's book, Africa and China, how Africans and their governments are shaping relationships with China. You can find links to both in the show notes. And here's my recommendation for today. In March, Switzerland published its official China strategy. The first time the country has a strategy geared towards a single country. If you want to understand how a country tries to conceptualize the opportunities and challenges that China poses, the document is well worth reading. In our next episode, we'll turn back to the Asian continent to discuss the ups, downs, lefts, and rights of the India-China relationship. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And do leave us a rating or review on iTunes. It really helps other people find the show. This episode of China and the World was produced and edited by Denise Schauble. My name is Nicolo Singe. See you soon. Follow Asia Society Switzerland on social media and visit our website for more information on upcoming events.